Um, but one of the things I think that's important to start with is the myth that there hasn't been any resistance up to now. Um, I don't know if people remember maybe about four years ago there was a demonstration in Greece and you know the front of the demo had some banner on it that said we are not the Irish, we fight back or something. It was all really embarrassing for us here. Um, and sometimes I think we reproduce that idea, you know, there's the idea that, that actually nothing much happens. Um, but actually there has been quite a lot, but it's been limited. So, for instance, if you go back to, I think it's 2009 and 2010, there were those three big ICTU marches, you know, each of which what was bringing out 70,000 to 100,000 people. Um, I mean, anybody who was on it probably also remembered there was being kind of miserable affairs that didn't, you know, they felt like you were kind of going for a long walk to, because you felt you wanted to make a point, but not that anything was going to come out of it. Um, in the same period as well, there was the public sector strike. Uh, I'm a public sector worker. There was like a quarter of a million uh, workers went on strike for a day. The media, of course, did the usual thing. But apparently everybody went shopping in the north, you know, if you uh, were to believe that. Um, but that was quite significant as well because one of, I, I work in a fairly big workplace and I ended up organising the pickets on one side of it. Um, and the thing I discovered was that actually nobody had been on strike before. Uh, you know, it was a completely new experience to them. Um, and you know, people, like people saying, what do you do? You know, you walk up and down. It's whatever they'd seen on television was obviously meant to be what you were doing. Um, there was the the campaign against household and water tax, and I'll talk about that in a minute because I think that's it's pretty important to understand what went wrong with that campaign to understand why things are actually better this time around. Uh, it, it's a useful starting point. And the other thing, of course, that was happening in this period uh, was Rossport. Now, in a way, people go, well, isn't that different? That would have been happening anyway. Yes, but, I mean, part of, the, uh, part of what that was about, in fact, was the taking of revenue that otherwise would probably have reduced the level of cuts we were actually seeing, or at least would mean there was, there was uh, uh, revenue coming in in the future. Um, and also, of course, for anybody involved in it, we saw a lot of uh, the same guard tactics that we've seen in housing estates around Dublin and Cork and elsewhere in the last couple of months happening back, happening in 2007 and 2008 back then. It's not entirely coincidental because the cop who's run, running the public audio unit up here uh, was running the uh, policing down in Rossport in 2007 and 2008. Um, we also saw a lot of workplace occupations and they were among the few things where people actually won. Now the thing is what they were winning was stuff like redundancy. I mean, they were you know, they weren't fighting for much, if you like, but uh, there was a whole string of those. Most of them ended in, in victories or partial victories, and most recent one probably being the Paris Bakery one, and then there was one in Cork of a film station that was shutting down. Um, and then, particularly in that 2008, 2009, early 2010, there were hundreds of smaller protests. I mean, I can sort of remember most weeks I was going to one or two, and there were, there were other ones I wasn't going to because there was just too much on. Some of them had 100 people, some 200. A couple of the teachers' unions had ones where there were 15,000 on, you know, there was something in between. So the idea that nobody resisted, you know, that there was nothing happening isn't particularly true. Um, but we, we had a couple of big, big problems. The easiest one to understand is uh, going back to that ICTU demonstration, the ICTU demonstrations, and that's that although it looked like stuff was going to happen in terms of the unions in 2009, 2010, actually that movement was completely contained by the union leadership. Um, they were never really seriously challenged. I mean, the only sort of semi-serious challenge was when people voted against Crow Park. Uh, but then they got Haddington Road through, which was the, the second agreement. It was nearly the same thing, but the, the, the votes uh, completely swung around. And what happened is people got frightened about going on strike and what that would mean, and there was the big media onslaught. A, a repeated story in this, in fact, is resistance being uh, dispersed by huge media smear campaigns. And again, understanding why that isn't working with this time around is useful. Um, the uh, yeah, so scare stories were a big thing. I mean, there were a big thing about Rossport. You know, everybody was supposed to be a provo who was involved and went through various stages. Uh, then there was also that setting divisions uh, to weaken things. So one of the big things in 2009 was setting public sector workers against private sector workers and setting both against the unemployed and you know setting up this whole thing. Well, if if they get a fiver, they're taking a fiver off you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, there's a there's a, a kind of cartoon of like a cliche capitalist who's got a plate full of biscuits in front of him on the table and, uh, and two workers sitting beside him. And the capitalist guy takes nine of the ten biscuits uh, for himself and then says to the two workers, they better keep an eye on each other because they're after the last remaining biscuits. And kind of that's what they did to us back then, over and over. Um, and probably it was really frustrating, I think, for anybody who was kind of aware of what was happening because it was quite transparent. And we go, how the hell can people fall for this? It's, you know, we can see what's going on here. Uh, and the other thing, of course, that happened was opposition was diverted into the idea that things would change if we had an election. Um, so the Fianna Fáil Green Party government got replaced by the Fianna Gael Labour Party government. And it was probably a year after that happened where you know, there was, it, things went quite quiet. You know, partially people giving them a chance, partially the Labour Party able to use its influence in both the unions and the community sector to calm things down. Um, the left's attempt, the radical left's attempt to break any of that completely failed. Uh, the big demoralising failure, I think, was that Haddington Road vote, because a lot of people had initial... Uh, you know, with Croke Park, they're going great. It looks like people are actually going to resist. The leaders aren't getting things that they're on way anymore. Haddington Road, more or less the same deal, went the opposite way. People got demoralised. Um, and I think one of the big lessons that that thought was important was that we found that while we could win arguments in individual trade union branches where there was a good left presence, uh, we couldn't where we didn't have people. And so, you know, you probably had 15 branches, mostly in Dublin, few in Cork, which voted the other way on Haddington Road, but there's, you know, 600-odd union branches in the country, so it didn't matter. So there was no way of talking to people uh, beyond that. That was a, one of our big restrictions. Um, so the next thing that happens, uh, which is you kind of get a grasp, the grasping greener over there uh, approach, with the failure of working the unions, the left quite strongly switched the household tax campaign. And that was kind of uh, quite a traditionally organised campaign. I, mean, I was involved in the water tax campaign back in the 1990s now, wasn't it, the first one, uh, and then in the bin tax campaign. And both of those and the household tax campaign came about because some of the radical left organisations got together, said, oh, we think there's a chance of building a big campaign around that, uh, set up the initial structures of it, started to try and organise things in campaign groups uh, around the city and then in different places around the country, uh, and then tried to run all that through national conferences. Now, that's pretty much the model the household tax campaign uh, came about with. Um, and there's problems with that model. I mean, one of the first problems is that centralisation because one of the things that happens with a centralised campaign like that, and particularly with the kind of crazily sectarian left organisations we have in Ireland, is they start to fight each other for who gets to control things. Mm -hmm. um, and the second problem, and this, this is a general problem the way politics works in Ireland, it's really common to, that people have a, a, a clientelist approach to politics, so, you know, the thing where you go to your local TD and you say, oh, I can't get the council to fix something, and the TD gets onto the council and it gets sorted out, so you vote for them at the next election, you know. Like, I mean, that's all kind of uh, the way Irish politics tends to work, and it tends to impose a, an organising model where people expect that to happen. Um, so common experience with the household tax campaign with people trying to get other local uh, campaign groups going is they leaflet an area, they hold a meeting, people come to the meeting, and they're trying to get them to, to organise the stuff that follows on from that, but that's not what happens. It comes out with this expectation that the organisers of the meeting are then going to organ keep organising everything into the future. And one of the problems with that, though, is if, if, if you're thinking of running for elections, that's not necessarily a bad thing for the party doing that, because it means people have a dependency with you. Um, but the electoral thing also had an effect then because what happened in lots of constituencies where rival organisations were eyeing things up for who was going to run in the elections is they also started fighting each other on a local level. Um, and you know, the question of who could, who could control a local campaign would then be the question of well, who was most likely to get elected in the next election. Um, so while the household tax campaign looked good, it was actually quite vulnerable. Uh, I mean, that lefty infighting at the national conferences demoralised a lot of activists, you know, and then you kind of just ended up in this pointless process that wasn't going anywhere. Uh, the, the, the whole structure of uh, the revenue being able to deduct payments from people's pay made non-payments seem quite ineffective. In fact, it kind of did make non-payments ineffective. Uh, the scare stories that were being published in the media of the left running the show sort of roughly mapped onto reality. I mean, it wasn't that simple, but, you know, you could, can, you could say, oh, this is secretly being run by Socialist Party or whatever else, and there was a certain level of truth in that. 
Um, and for the most part, we didn't have any way of answering that back either. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that last thing was really important. We still didn't have any voice in which to order, uh, in which to answer media smear stories. So what's happened since? Well, one of the things that I'm going to look at is the way the world itself has changed. Um, and uh, I don't know if people have seen Lord of the Rings, but there's a, a line where he goes on about the forces of Mordor already on the march. Well, in this case, it's the forces of Facebook being already on the march. Um, Facebook went public in September 2006, and Twitter shortly before that date. So they're only ten, well, it's eight years old, right? Um, and uh, I mean, really, in fact, it, it's much more recently that we began to see a sort of impact in terms of political organising. Um, by 2011, the power of social network for political organising started to become visible to lots of people in uh, what came to be called the Arab Spring. So, you know, the revolts in Tunisia, Egypt, etc. that spread around. There was something like, oh, what, how, how are these things happening? You know, where are they coming from? People, you, know, you know, the kind of uh, Mubarak or whatever is getting up and blaming the internet. And the, the Gezi Park there a couple of years ago, you've got... Uh, Erdogan getting up and blaming Twitter, and you have these different things going on with us. Oh, it's this new technology, you know. And um, you know, so Joan Bruton blaming people's mobile phones about a, a month back here. It's all part of the same sort of, you know, general uh, threat. Um, and it suggested uh, that what was coming into being was a different sort of model of organising, uh, one that was very different from the old style of centralisation with left parties running things. But there's a reason that old pattern existed, and the reason it existed was it used to be quite difficult to communicate with lots of people. You basically needed resources. So if you were Dennis O'Brien, for instance, and you own all the national media, it's very, very easy. Uh, you know, if you're us sitting in a room and we don't have that much money, so the only way we could possibly do that is we get together, we put our money together, we print a load of leaflets and we give them out, and generally you end up doing that through uh, political organisations, and that gives a certain form, form to things. Um, so in the Irish case, um, so there's a, there's a couple of other, so that's a general international pattern. But there's some very specific local stuff, um, which also ties into the international pattern. I mean, one is the experience of uh, people coming out of Occupy. Now, Occupy wasn't huge here, uh, but what did happen in most of the Occupies was there was a conflict with left organisations, and people came out of it, they formed particular impressions of what those organisations were like. Uh, the household tax, you know, again, at the same story, you had a lot of people kind of looking at the way the left organisations were working and so deciding not, they're not liking things and, again, coming out with an impression. Uh, the United Left Alliance at the time, that electoral front, also had the same thing. So, you know, you find as you go around, you talk to people, uh, particularly, say, people involved in the difference. There's no formations around the place. It's quite common to have people telling you stories about being involved in one or more of those things and being pissed off by the SWP or the SP or whatever else. It's, it's quite a common experience. And really, as the water charge campaign started to emerge, there were two distinct visible strands within it. Um, one is the is, is kind of running along the, uh, the style of the old model is uh, right to water, you know, initially set up by the Socialist Workers' Party, done as a traditional broad alliance, uh, unions, etc., being on board, but kind of under the direction of that party in the way those, those things normally are, and also set up in a way that makes it fairly conservative is the wrong word to use, but you know, cautious, you know, like even around the, the issue of non-payments uh, and exactly what's been said. And then the second model you got was groups forming um, semi-spontaneously, I mean, the, the were existing networks, and particularly using social media and people coming together around that. Um, and the key thing in that process was the resistance to water meter installation. Now, as far as I know, before this started, like in terms of left organisations, nobody was making that any sort of issue at all. There wasn't really, you know, it just wasn't something that, that any of the groups were talking about or built a strategy around. Um, and as that started happening, you started getting to the thing where people were videoing stuff, they were taking photographs, um, and they were sharing those. And in particular, as you got the guards trying to shut things down, or you got Irish water workers being aggressive, a lot of people started viewing this stuff. And as people started viewing stuff, they were going, well, if they can do that over there, why can't we do it here? Um, and so it became this self-replicating thing where people saw stuff, they copied it, they made videos of themselves, other people saw it, and it, it spread out. And in some places it has worked well, in other places it was harder, but lots and lots of places suddenly started to see resistance like that. 
Um, and the other really important thing, of, I think, about the videos, like particularly the ones involving God of violence, um, I mean, they were being ignored by the media, but tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people were seeing these things. So that meant by the time the media started cover, covering them, pe a lot of people had already been inoculated uh, against the traditional smear, uh, yeah, smear campaigns. Um, you know, so it's like as a kid, you're given a jab for uh, rubella or something, and that means when you're exposed to it as an adult, you're, you're much less susceptible to, ca uh, to catch it. Uh, with this, with the media smears, because people had seen these stories, by the time the media started representing them, people were like, yeah, I, I know what actually happened there, you're just talking rubbish. Um, and I think the first clue that something unusual was happening was that march that I think was caused, called by Dublin Says No, I'm not quite sure, uh, sure back in October, uh, to which, you know, at least 1,500 probably attended. You know, and that was quite a surprise. Everybody's going, oh, okay, that's normally a weekly march of 15 to 40 people or something. Where the hell are all these uh, people coming from? Um, then the, uh, the 1st of November demonstration that I think was called by the Right to, uh, right to Water campaign, that had huge numbers on it. Now, people have widely different estimates of how many there were, and I've actually got quite low ones, but... Regardless, it was one of the biggest demonstrations Dublin had seen in quite a number of years. Um, on the 29th of November, there's the second set of demonstrations, the other ones that are dispersed all around the place, but people also come into the city centre, and it ends, up, it ends up as being a pretty huge demonstration on O'Connell Street. Um, and this is the point at which the establishment starts to panic. Um, so in the... Uh, the week before Jobstown, we start to see all this stuff about, you know, a sinister fringe uh, that's running things. And I first became aware of, uh, aware of it when uh, Victoria White uh, wrote an article in the Irish Examiner using some of this, and she quoted this something from a speech I'd made in Galway, like 15, 10 years earlier. And I was kind of going, what the hell, where did that come from? So that made me quite curious, and I started watching this and trying to understand where it was coming from um, at, at that particular point. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so by the time the Jobstown protest happened and the infamous uh, Jobstown brick incident um, occurred, uh, there was like, you know, people already quite wound up about it. Now, I thought the really interesting thing about the brick uh, was I, when that first picture went up, I was on social media and instantly everybody was saying, this is Photoshop, it's fake, blah, blah, blah. Now, I actually do a fair bit of photography, so I was sort of going, I think it pro it's probably real. It's, you know, and the artifacts you're seeing are, you know, there's reasons why that happens. But the really interesting thing was the distrust of the media had increased to the point that people's automatic assumption was, this is fake. You know, so, if, you know, like as I said, my attitude with, towards it is, you know, if you have hours of confrontation with cops in that sort of situation, the odds of somebody throwing a brick are quite reasonable. Um, you know, but it, I mean, what really mattered there was the way people reacted to it and the assumption that this was either a setup or it was the media, uh, or it was a fake picture, or sometimes it was a combination of all three, which didn't make that much sense. And the second thing we saw in the aftermath of Jobstown was the government introducing a whole set of concessions uh, and sort of saying, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to put it off for a while. It's going to be, you know, be much smaller than people are expecting, and we guarantee it will be like that for a few years. And that's really traditional. Uh, in, in, the, um, in the past, what worked was uh, concessions and smears together, and the whole idea was to separate what they like to call Middle Ireland off from the radicals and marginalised communities. And, I mean, in fact, around this time, there's loads of journalists actually kept using the phrase Middle Ireland in the paper, and OT kept telling us that enough had been done to make Middle, Middle, Ireland, Middle Ireland happy, and it was only the head cases who were going to be continuing on. Um, you know, I'm trying to establish a particular story in people's minds, and that's a kind of, you know, it's a ca combination of carrot and stick. We'll give you something, and if you, anybody who doesn't take it, we're going to give you a beaten instead. Uh, that's normally been successful. Didn't work at all this time around, so what's different? Um, I think one of the really important things is that social media effect, uh, because what that's effectively done is, previously, you know, when Dennis O'Brien or Archie published a load of rubbish, we didn't have a way of replying. I mean, you know, I could tell the people I knew immediately around me, you know, an organisation like us, WSM, which is fairly small, we could maybe print 5,000 leaflets and spend hours and hours giving them out to people or something. Maybe they'd read them, maybe they wouldn't. Uh, but there wasn't anything really effective. Whereas what we're seeing this time around is you, you, you know, images or stories you can create or can get shared within 24 hours or 48 hours to as many as a million people. I mean, we'd something during the week, in fact, I think, that went to over a million people. Um, 
And one of the amusing demonstrations of that was when they, like, all the brick craziness was going on, uh, somebody had the idea of setting up a page called, like, I bet this brick can get more likes than the Labour Party. And yeah, 16 hours later, it's got more likes than Joan Bruton, and I think 48 hours later, it's, you know, it, it's ahead of Labour or something. So they created all the fear around brick, and the brick was a terrible thing, but actually the brick turned out to be more popular than they were. Um, and that's another example of inoculation. You know, the scare stories of yesterday suddenly become the jokes of today, and people are laughing at them because they're going on about them. And I think by far the clearest illustration of that was what happened at Santry and then afterwards at Kulak uh, Garda Station. Uh, so that's where um, End is meeting Dennis O'Brien. There's a protest outside. The cops are obviously told to go in heavy-handed, and they just start shoving people all over the place. There's video call of that. That gets shared out. Um, and the reaction to that, the sort of usual media thing of, oh, violence, people are going crazy, blah, 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 uh, instead of people backing off was the women's vigils that we saw. Um, first of all in Kulak, but then they started spreading all around the place. There was one in um, Mullingar or somewhere like that, where it's going, oh, Mullingar, that's crazy. Who's ever heard of an anti-police brutality vigil, vigil in Mullingar? And then, about two weeks ago, there was one in Greystones. Now, Greystones, to me, is kind of like the picture image of the, you know, relatively prosperous, nice seaside town. It's, it's Middle Ireland. So that this would also happen there. You're going, oh, okay, that, that, that has really fallen itself. On its foot. Now, December 10th, the recent demonstration was what I considered a big test, and I gave a version of this talk in Belfast three days beforehand, and I was saying to people, look, I honestly don't know what's going to be happening. I mean, they've actually, the government has played it quite cleverly, because the media went pretty much silent for ten days before the protest. I remember I was going up on Sunday morning, and I went into the news agents in the train station and you know, to check the headlines, and yeah, no scare stories at all, they just weren't publishing it, anything. Uh, the guards backed off massively as well. Um, I was in uh, a couple of days, uh, the, the previous Friday, I think, I'd been in Stony Batter, and uh, the, I mean, the, that's a group of people who were blocking the trucks, and there's the cops and the Irish water guys, and the cops didn't come anywhere near us at all, except just as I was heading over to work, the senior cop came over and he went, we're, we're here to help facilitate protests, you know, if any of you have any trouble, then, uh, you know, here's my number, you can call me at the station, and, you know, all this sort of stuff. You're just going, what? <laughs> That's weird, you know. The week earlier, they're dragging people to court with injunctions and all this sort of stuff, and now that atmosphere is in, entirely changed. And, of course, it's switched back since the protests. So, I mean, quite clearly, that's the word going up. Look, don't antagonise people. Maybe, maybe that will reduce the numbers that are actually going to come out. As I said, when it was in Belfast, I thought maybe that's going to work. Uh, it didn't work. I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure, actually, that was the biggest protest of the lot so far, uh, just in terms of the areas covered and stuff. Uh, the stick clearly came back out. Uh, I mean, when I, when I actually saw this picture afterwards, I thought it was fake initially. Because I was going, oh, somebody's done that thing where they've pulled a picture up from Europe or whatever. You know, they don't have dogs here. And I was like, oh, wait, no, that's because the history. And actually, I then looked at my, the pictures I'd taken myself, and I'd done a few over my head. And when I looked at the background, I was going, oh, no, that's the same thing. So that, that's actually real. Um, and, of course, the uh, smear campaign started again. These got particularly great. The... Uh, Yes, protest to make shocking Facebook threat towards Taoiseach, which was some, some person obviously said, I want to kill the guy or something, and they made a story out of that. Um, and I don't know how many people saw this, but the, uh, the Sunday World one the other day, which was amazing, because you, kind of, you look at this and you go, oh, fuck, they really petal bombed that van. And then you read the caption where it says how it could have looked, and you're like, what? <laughs> you go, no, hang on, wait, they couldn't have printed that. No, they did. They actually, you know, so it's just a complete sort of invention. All that excitement for nothing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, people are back in the courts today, although they, they put that off until after uh, the new year. Now, I think that's interesting in itself, because, of course, they did the same thing just before the demonstration. So, like, in the bin tax campaign, when they put injunctions on people, they put them in jail pretty much straight away. So there were 23 people jailed within, I think, over oh, about space for about two weeks. One of those people was a nursing mother, so they were obviously saying, well, no, we'll jail anybody out of it. But this time around, they've done repeated court cases, and then, you know, they had the, the, the three guys who got bound over for 28 days, which was kind of like, for breaking an injunction, that's, how the hell does that work? That's not the way that's meant to work at all. So they're obviously too scared to move against it. They're scared that if they start jail people, that, you know, that that will cause mobilizations. Um, so, so I think where we are now is really interesting, just coming to an end on these points. Um, 
the movement's really massive, and it's also really, really broad. I mean, that was, I spent a good part of December the 10th standing near the entrance to Marion Square giving people those leaflets. And that was really interesting because you had, you know, little micro interactions with, I think, 800 or 900 people. And there were, like, there were people from all over the country, all sorts of people had come along, and it was quite obvious. Um, I mean, I think afterwards they were trying to say they're all Sinn Féin, but this was something which was quite strange. Um, and, and one of the questions, I think, for us is, is like, where does that sort of go? Uh, you know, what should we be doing? Um, I think one of the key things, and I think this is where, as anarchists, we have a somewhat different approach to the rest of the left, because I think there's a tendency by a lot of the left parties to see the kind of uh, loose, self, self-organized nature of this as a bit of a problem. So you probably might have noticed last weekend there were suddenly all these talks that, oh, we need a new le- you know, left electoral <coughs> alliance, we need to bring people before profit and the anti-austerity alliance together because the people are confused by the fact that there's these two different things and so we need to simplify this and get everybody together. And I think one of the things we can usefully say is no, actually it's pretty good that what we actually have is lots of self-organized things that are not being run from some central command post. Um, I think resisting that turn towards electoralism and, and party control is quite important. Uh, I think the, the other thing is... Um, is building on the collapse in, of, of trust in authority. I mean, you know, people don't believe politicians, people don't believe the media, people don't trust the guards. And, like, for a lot of, a lot of the people that have gone to those positions, that's quite recent. They wouldn't necessarily have said the same thing two months ago or six months ago. I mean, like, you see that when you're following all the Facebook discussions. People have, like, something a lot of people say is my attitudes have been completely changed. Um, and I think, yeah, so that's the... the, the Challenges, there's two things. One is, I mean, I think the... I can't see at the moment how we're not going to win this, right? Um, but I think the thing is, what, they, what we'll end up with is a set of concessions, and then they'll do like they did in the 90s. They'll wait 10 years and come back around. What they'll have to do to get it to that point is interesting. I mean, maybe, you know, if the mobilizations keep happening, and I said this in Belfast, I think we'd probably get to the point where maybe uh, Ender Kenny and Bruton will have to resign. Mm -hmm. You know, if it gets pushed further, then we might even get to the point where they call an early election. You know, and both of those things, I mean, I think a lot of the left are sort of saying, oh, great, overthrow the government, et cetera, et cetera. You can do, I mean, if that happens, it just means we get a new government. I mean, in Argentina in 2001, they got new governments nine times over the course of about 18 months mm-hmm. until eventually they got stability and, and that worked out. Um, and so I think the question is how we keep that process of radicalization going. And, uh, yep, that's it. So people have questions, comments, strong disagreements, or want to throw things at me? Don't do the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, do you want to hand out those uh, feedback oh, questions? Right. questions? Yeah, probably just want to, I probably agree with mostly what you said there, but there's kind of, it's almost like a unique opportunity at the same time because we've got communities around the country essentially being radicalised and there's an incredibly big shift in their position, like you're saying, uh, how they're viewing authority. And uh, it's, a, it's kind of a dream for people like us who are kind of in trying to encourage people into kind of more disobedience actions and this kind of thing, like uh, on December the 10th, the people were already there, you know, they, they, were, they were ready to take further action themselves, like, uh, without any prompting whatsoever, like, you know, like, so it's, it's really, really nice to see, I think. I would, I would, I would just put out a cheering voice, like, if you don't, if you don't, maybe you can support 50 Facebook pages now. Some of them might be two people, some of them might be 50 people, who knows. But there probably would be about maybe 80, 90 sort of organised units of different types of people, really people leading, doing stuff. And I suspect that if you did an actual study and you went around the country and you looked at the effectiveness of those groups, it would be inversely proportional to the level of control that political parties have in them. Right? So the, so the, the, ones, the ones where there's no direct part of political control, are the most you know, radical, are the most active, are the most energetic. And that goes right down to the ones where the strongest level of sort of entryism, where they do sort of token stuff, like, you know, give it a leaf, it's doing polls, that type of thing. And I think what happened this time was that the water meter was struggled. It began completely spontaneously in court and spread. And by that time, the whole water issue had been abandoned by the sort of so-called organised left. Right? They just walked away from it. 
Um, and it remains so until October 11th, uh, when our that demonstration by the Northside groups, which had about three or four thousand people, and then there was an idea that sort of something was happening, it was a surprise. But um, like I, 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 I think that the, the level of so you have to ask yourself, like, why, why, how did this happen? And I think that, like, how did this kind of organisation happen? And what, what, what brought it about? Like, you know, and I think the, the, the reason is that the level of discontent in the country is extremely strong. Right? I mean, people are really discontent with what's going on in the country. But what people don't see is any vehicle for that discontent. There's, there's nothing to get onto, right? And they have rejected the, the, the left, you know, I mean, the parties of the left, you know as a vehicle, quite correctly, for any kind of real change, right? And the, the water chair, uh, the property tax campaign, where you had this kind of forced agenda of electoralism by the Socialist Party, split that campaign in the middle, and ha at least more than half of that movement was completely independent, right? And that led to a sort of a, a despair at the, at the, 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 the political parties. So the water, the water meter blocking was seen as a vehicle, I mean, that was kind of a, a bus, that you could get onto, that could actually get this campaign going. There was a group of people that were taking action, and you know, like water meters won't stop the charges, but it will stop the privatisation to a large extent. Come on, you know that thing. But I, I, I just think that it's people want to do something this country, but they have to be given the, the um, sort of the bus to get onto. You know what I mean? The vehicle, because it's not good enough to be unhappy. You have to. People won't act until they see that. Their acting is going to be successful. Do you know what I mean? Well, we need more people to be kind of like asking those questions and having those conversations, saying like, you know, you've been given a very limited picture of how the world works. As in Europe, they're protesting and they do things differently. They don't take the shite we take of the politicians. Politicians are a lot more scared in Europe of their electors than our politicians are. And hey, what is this, this system anyway where we have to go to the politicians and say, like, I'm having trouble getting my, my rent supplement, you know, I'm paying my rent allowance. You know, can, you, can you do something? We should have an effective civil service. So, I mean, it really works in the favour of politicians that, you know, the system is so unwieldy. They have to go to a politician for that. And then you kind of like, you owe them one. A vote. You know, it shouldn't be. The, the system should work for us. We're paying for it. You know. But we have to be careful that doesn't get turned into kind of like, oh, public service versus private service. Public sector, workers, bad guys. Because, you, know, uh, you know, this is it's such a common thing that we alluded to earlier. Like, I remember the time of the bailout. It's like the, the massive, great big fights on the radio. Oh, the private sector, you don't know how, how easy you had it. Oh, public sector, you cushed each other. All the time attacking each other. And it's the people right at the top of the old money. They're the enemy. <laughs> uh, well, is it, when, when you mentioned about the politicians, like I don't see the difference between whether you have a left liar or a right liar. They are all bloody liars, <laughs> like you know that way. Uh, but maybe one of the problems is because the, I'm, I'm, I'm anti the current peasant system. Is I certainly don't have any alternative. As was well, politicians sell kind of this false hope thing, or, yeah. or, or uh, solutions, <laughs> or false solutions. I think, or whatever. I'm wondering if they really are the ones in charge anyway, you know, they seem to be very much thought, you know, they tell us what you know, we want to hear, it's been like this, and yeah. they're operating with a totally different agenda yeah. than what they tell us about. Well, that's what it seems to be. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think from from our perspective, we'd say that's the way the political system was set up to work. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's pretty much the way it works in most countries, I mean, like the, I saw some statistics for the American elections recently, but I think oh, this... Not. This and the last century combined, the winning candidate for presidency has always been the person with the most money. You know, well, has collected the most funds to run for it. So it's, you know, it's almost not the actual election itself is now almost a side sideshow at this point in yeah. time. It's purely, and I mean, the money doesn't come from individuals sending in five and ten dollars. It comes from, you know, big companies deciding who's the better person to back in terms of their policy. And I mean, in, in the Irish context, well, it's pretty obvious. Like people like Dennis O'Brien with an awful lot of this. I mean. I don't know if people saw the thing about those fancy new security barriers they had on December the 10th. Oh, yeah, yeah. Apparently, they're, they're actually, they, they come from a company he owns. He went, so, so, even makes money out of his protests yeah, these yeah. days. It's kind of like, wow! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they famous, they put barriers um, as well. They don't come over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you make it, we can flip them over. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I think there's a chasm open up like, in Irish politics in the sense that people correctly identify the problem as being like, 
electoral politics, right? Mm -hmm. what, the, 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 the mainstream parties, three big parties, can now only garner about 48% of the votes, the vote, right? Um, there was a big swing to Sinn Féin, but I was involved in that, and I saw what was going on there where I live. And the sweet, the sweet to Sinn Féin that in, in the last council elections wasn't to do any great support for Sinn Féin. It was simply to do with the fact that they were the only group, the only party in Ireland that hadn't tarnished themselves completely with sleaze and corruption and what have you, right? So, like, you know, there's, there's a, and also there's a, a massive rejection of any party going on in that election, right? Now, of course, independents aren't any, any fundamentally any different to parties, they're just like singleton parties, it's the exact same problem. You know, but, you know, you have to say, why are people talking independence? I think that they see the, 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 the whip system, the, you know, the electoral system as the problem, right? the, the fact that they've no representation, you know, there's no translation between their, what they want to do in the country and what they want to do. And, and then, that, that's part of the, like, like I, I, I think that's, you need to realise how deep that is. You know, it's much deeper, or possibly, than people think it is. Like, the, the, you know, um, so, like, I don't know what the solution to that is, but all, that, that transfers into, into kind of campaign groups. You see the same pattern in the Water Charges campaign. There's been a concerted effort to sort of not have... The same as what went on in the property charges campaign to try and have self you know, local, locally organised campaigns. It's, it's very strongly, you know, localised in the in the, the water charges thing. I think that's part of that they, they correctly identify all parties sort of as the, you know, as part of the problem, not the solution. It's not a question of just choosing a new sort of um, party. In terms of solutions, I mean, I, I think actually there's something interesting that's happening um, in terms of the way this is being organised, because traditionally we're told that the reason we need politicians and the reason we need employers is that we're not capable of making decisions ourselves, you know, that we can, we can kind of crudely decide, well, we want that party rather than the other party, but the actual detail of power, the detail of running a company or whatever else is such, that most of us aren't really capable of that, so our choices. Well, actually, with the company, you don't get to pick your bosses, but with the, with the politicians, you do. Um, and, the, I mean, that's also been the way that kind of a lot of mass campaigns have run, like in terms of the old household tax campaign, you know, was kind of about, well, who do we trust the most to be a delegate to, to go to the conference, and often that translated into which political party do we trust the most. And the interesting thing to me in terms of the way things have been organised, I don't want to overemphasise the online aspect. I think that it's important, but obviously it, it's one side of an equation and the other side is people actually meeting up and doing stuff on the streets as well and, and using online stuff to help them. But the other thing that is, it's also becoming a different idea about how things can be decided. Like how, how can you communicate with other people? How can you reach decisions with other people? You know, How can you decide whether you're going to stand on top of the the individual installation points or block the trucks getting in, all those sort of things. Like people start are making those decisions now. And that does a, a, I think one of the things you can start suggesting is that, well, if we can do this in relation to this particular situation, which is often a difficult situation, it's confrontational, you have the cops involved, uh, you know, people getting up repeatedly in cold mornings at the moment. If you can do that sort of situation, what other things can we apply that sort of thing to? I mean, what other things do we have in relation to the problems we face? Um, one of the things that somebody pointed out to me in Belfast is that Haddington Road Agreement is up, um, I think, next year. We're gonna have to, so they're going to have to agree, come up with some new agreements, and that's going to have to be put to all the public sector workers to vote on, right? And the thing is, now the people voting on that, like a lot of them are going to be people who've had experience of organising in relation to uh, the, the local protests. And I mean, that will have done two things. One is, it's probably changed their attitude towards what the establishment is. They're going to be a lot more cynical about that and probably going to be a lot more cynical about what media is saying. But it's also given people a communication network and a set of organisational skills. So I think what could be really interesting is when that comes back up again, is if actually there's a really strong opposition to it that says no. 
you know, and, and you know, not running through the necessarily through the existing union setup at all. I mean, that's the way kind of we used to look traditionally at this. You'd assume that this would be directed by people who have to be shop stewards and stuff, but now that might not even be the way it goes. Because uh, if that gets kicked out, then that sort of starts turning up another sort of crisis. Mm-hmm. And it also means that, that that also means people start start to actually get up, getting organised where they work. So I think if you saw the emergence of the sort of organisation we've seen in housing estates right. in workplaces, that would get really interesting. Because you know, then that question is, well, what exactly is the role of the boss in the equation here? You know, do we actually need that person? And if you look at most actual revolutionary transformations, that's what actually kicked them off. It wasn't, I mean, history tends to present them as, you know, a load of people from some party got together and came up with a plot and stormed the Winter Palace on a particular day or whatever. But actually, the, the crisis point normally is where you have a whole load of things happening in society, people are getting unhappy, and at a certain point, people start taking over the places they work, and they need to start dealing with the question of how do you continue to produce and how do you exchange goods and all that sort of thing. And you suddenly get a completely different discussion emerges. Um, you know, so I mean, it, it, like it's really hard to see that happening in Ireland in the short term because from where we were a couple of years ago, which was really kind of that narrow debate the media had, you know, where like you really no choice at all, you know, and you've been asked to make choices between you, no choices and people were confused to opening up this other vista of, well, you know, is, can we reconstruct the way society works? Um, but I certainly think that's what we should be saying to people. And you know, get get people thinking about that as an idea. What what's the actual? I mean, why why assume that the best we can get out of this is Sinn Fein and government? Mm-hmm. You know, other 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 things.